All right, now we'll show you my favorite explanation for why the inversion algorithm works. I will ask you three simple questions and each one of them will have a simple answer and the answer to the last simple question will be the explanation to the algorithm. Each question involves writing a matrix next to A and performing Gaussian elimination until the entire matrix is in the row reduced echelon form. And the question each time is what will that row reduced echelon form look like? In all of the cases, A is a square invertible matrix. And in the first question, let's write A next to A. So we have two of the A matrix side by side and we're now performing Gaussian elimination until the combined matrix is in the row reduced echelon form. So the hallmark of Gaussian elimination is that it preserves the relationships among the columns. So if we understand the relationships among the columns for the initial matrix, then we'll understand and we'll know what the relationship among the columns is for the eventual matrix, because it'll be the same as it is for the original matrix, and that will contain the answer. Now when we put A next to A, what we have is the first, let's say three, let's call A three by three, although this of course works for N by N. All right, so let's, the first three columns are linearly independent, and the next three columns are the same as the first three. And that will be reflected in the row reduced echelon form. This left part will be the identity, and the right part, the columns will be the same as the first three columns. So in this case, the row reduced echelon form will consist of the identity and another identity next to it. We know why the left side will be the identity, because the columns are linearly independent, but the right side will be the identity because the original matrix, the same set of columns is the same as the first. So in the eventual matrix, the second set of columns will be the same as the first. What about if we put the matrix A times B next to A? Well, let's think about it. The first, the left half will once again be identity for the same reason. But what is the relationship of these columns to the columns of A? Well, this product, by the very definition of matrix product, is linear combinations of the columns of A, where the coefficients come from the columns of B. So the first column will be, of course, linearly dependent on the three columns that came before it. And that, and it will be what linear combination? Well, it will be the linear combination given by the first column of B. The coefficients for that linear combination, which gives us the fourth column, in other words, the first column of the second half, the fourth column, as the linear combination of these columns will be given by the coefficients that are the first column of the matrix B. That's by the very definition of matrix multiplication. Same thing for the fifth column, same thing for the sixth column. They will be all linear combinations of these columns where the coefficients, where the relationship is given by the entries of the columns of B. And that relationship will be preserved in the eventual row reduced echelon form. So what we'll have left is simply the matrix B. Very simple answer. And now we have arrived at our algorithm for matrix inversion. Write identity next to A, perform Gaussian elimination. What will we see at the end? Well, on the left, we'll see the identity matrix. But what will we see on the right? There are two ways of answering the question. One is just referring back to this question. This has a special case of this, because after all, identity is A times A inverse. And as we argued before, when we have A and A times any matrix next to it, in the eventual row reduced echelon form, it'll be identity times A gets dropped and it's whatever the other matrix is, which in this case, is A inverse. So by the second case, what will be left here is A inverse. So that's the explanation. I think it might be a little bit more insightful to repeat the logic of what's going on here. What's the relationship of the columns of A, of the columns of I, excuse me, to the columns of A? Well, it is linearly dependent on the columns of A. After all, the columns of A form a basis for Rn in this case R3, they can expand any column, 
in particularly the first column of the identity. And what is the relationship of the first column of the identity? Well, by the very definition of matrix multiplication and what A inverse means, that the relationship of the first column of the identity to the columns of A is given by the entries of the first column of A inverse. A inverse is that very matrix that provides the coefficients for the columns of A that yield the columns of identity. So when this matrix is brought into the row reduced echelon form, that relationship will be preserved. And the first column of this matrix, which we now know to be A inverse, will have the exact same relationship to the columns of identity as this first column of identity had to the matrix A. And that relationship is given by the first column of A inverse. And if you take the, co the entries of the first column of A inverse and form the linear combination of the columns of the identity using those coefficients, then naturally you will end up with the first column of A inverse. And similarly for the second column of A inverse and so forth. So that's my second and best explanation, shortest for sure, of why this algorithm actually produces A inverse. Later on, when we study elementary matrices, I will provide yet another proof of why this algorithm works.